Uh, well, good evening, everybody. Thanks for being here uh, for this uh, Peter Brett Memorial Lecture. Uh, my name's Matthew Harding. I'm the Dean of the Law School, and um, I'm very glad that you've joined us this evening. Um, can I start by acknowledging the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nations as the traditional owners of the land on which the law school sits? And can I pay respects to their elders past, present and emerging? Let me say a few words to introduce the Peter Brett Memorial Lecture before I turn to our distinguished speaker. Uh, the lecture um, takes place each year here at the law school and it's named uh, in honour of uh, the late criminal law scholar Peter Brett. Peter Brett was appointed a senior lecturer in this law school in 1955 uh, and then reader in 1961. He subsequently held the Hearn Chair here at the university from 1963 to 1964 and he was Professor of Jurisprudence here from 1964 until he passed away in 1975. Um, he had a distinguished career in the law, characterised by outstanding scholarship in criminal law and legal philosophy, and also uh, a determination to contest injustice in the legal system. He was one of a group of lawyers uh, who, in 1962, uh, stopped the hanging of Paul Tate, uh, creating a landmark in the history of uh, punishment in our country. Uh, this year, we're very pleased uh, to host the Peter Brett Memorial Lecture <coughs> excuse me, through the agency of our Melbourne Criminal Law Research Forum, and I'm pleased that Professor Heather Douglas uh, is with us. She's one of the leaders of that forum. Uh, based within the Melbourne Law School, the forum uh, brings together uh, criminal law scholars from across Australia and New Zealand, uh, and in a collegial uh, manner, uh, these uh, scholars discuss contemporary criminal law theories and procedures together. Uh, it's a very important and welcome development for us here at the Melbourne Law School uh, to host the forum and um, looking forward to seeing all that it does in the years to come. Can I, can I then turn to our distinguished speaker this evening? Uh, Professor Ali Lofnan is Professor of Criminal Law and Criminal Law Theory at the University of Sydney. She's a past director of the Sydney Institute of Criminology and a former editor of the Sydney Law Review and current uh, interests in criminal justice. Uh, Professor Lofnan works at the intersection of criminal law, legal theory and legal history, uh, much like Peter Brett himself. She's the author of two monographs, Self, Others and the State, Relations of Criminal Responsibility, published by Cambridge University Press in 2020, and Manifest Madness, Mental Incapacity in Criminal Law, published by Oxford University Press in 2012. She's also the author of numerous articles, chapters, and other works. She holds degrees from the University of Sydney, New York University, and the London School of Economics. This evening, she'll speak to us on a sensitive but fascinating aspect of criminal law, which is the practice of naming laws after the victims of homicide. And she'll explore the range of motives behind this emerging trend. Professor Lofnan, it's my pleasure now to invite you to deliver the Peter Brett Memorial Lecture for 2023. Thanks. Thank you very much, Matthew. Um, I begin with an acknowledgement of country. I'd also like to pay my respects to the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nations, on whose lands we're meeting tonight. And I pay my respects to their elders past, present, and emerging. I'd like to thank Matthew, Heather, and Jeremy very much for the beautiful honour of being able to present the lecture tonight. It's absolutely a pleasure to be here, and I'm um, very um, um, aware of the enormous footsteps that Peter Brett set up with his interest in academic work and practice in the law, and I think that's a, a really rather large model for current scholars. Um, I'm going to dedicate the lecture tonight to the victims of crime that I'm going to mention. <coughs> it's in their honour that I'm speaking tonight. Something intriguing is happening in criminal law. 
In recent decades, a number of laws have been named after victims of crime and victim survivors. There are numerous examples of this practice. And just this week, in this jurisdiction, a law that had been named Pockham's Law, utilising the nickname of a Guchamara Jaja Warung Wiradjuri Yorta Yorta woman, whose name has been used in the press coverage um, of this new development with permission from the family, but whose name I will not use tonight, after she died a preventable death in a prison cell, repeatedly calling for help, having been held on remand on suspicion of shoplifting. The call to enact Pockham's Law, using her nickname, was asking for a wholesale reform of bail laws, including the presumption against bail and the practice of remanding people who will not be likely to serve a custodial sentence even if they're convicted. Pockham's mother, Auntie Donna Nelson, says, I will not let my Pockham's death be forgotten. I urge you all to remember her too and support our family in the continued fight for change and for justice for my daughter. As these strong words indicate, families have distinct motives for advocating for law reform on behalf following the traumatic loss of a loved one to crime. This practice, which I'm calling eponymous law, also has distinct significance for the criminal law. And it's this that I'm going to be talking about tonight. So this lecture aims to introduce this topic of eponymous law as a practice and to start or kickstart thinking, research and discussion about it. Let's begin with some orientation, some signposts to guide the discussion. What is eponymous law? Within the criminal law and criminal justice context, this is law that involves the creation of a new law or the amendment of an existing law in the name of a victim or victim survivor of crime. These names may be used as a rhetorical shorthand in press or social media treatment of media coverage of crime, but they may also sit alongside the official name of legislation arising sometimes in brackets following the long and technical name of criminal legislation. These types of laws arise outside legal institutions via advocacy on the part of families, friends and victims themselves who are lay people rather than criminal justice or legal professionals. In some cases, victim survivors advocate for themselves, but in other instances where the victim has been killed as a result of crime, their family and friends advocate in their name. Eponymous law is a, is a subset of a larger category of what we could call victim-oriented law reform. But I think within this larger category, this is a distinctive type of law reform. And I think it's distinctive not only for the meanings it has for victims' families, but also for the meanings and significance it has for the criminal law. Eponymous law is a relatively new practice. It emerged in the last decades of the 20th century and spread around the world. It's usually traced to the creation of Megan's Law in the United States, which people may be aware was um, uh, enacted in New Jersey and at federal level in the states and then also in other states following the abduction, sexual assault and murder of Megan Kanka, who was seven years old. The laws make publicly accessible sex offender registries and that means that people, members of the public can access the location of a sex offender. Megan, Megan's um, murder was caused, was, uh, the person convicted of Megan's murder was a registered sex offender who lived opposite her. There's a similar, there, has, there was a similar crime and a similar type of law enacted in England and Wales in 2000 called Sarah's Law. And then people will probably be aware in our own country at home, we have calls for enacting Daniel's Law, which has been named after Daniel Morecambe, who was abducted and killed on the Sunshine Coast in 2003. When he was later, when the person convicted of his murder was um, identified as a registered sex offender, a previous sex offence, then there were calls to have the same kinds of publicly available sex offender registries here. That's happened in some states, but not yet, or not at federal level. 
I think of eponymous law as a practice, a social practice, a particular set of knowledge formations. And as a result of this approach or perspective, I'm interested in the broad social meanings of eponymous laws, as well as their technical legal content. Viewed as a practice, eponymous law is an act of memorialization, creating a lasting memory or a tribute, and an act of commemoration, honoring and remembering on the part of victims and families. Such an act would usually fall outside the law in the realm of the cultural, as is the case with physical memorials. We can all think of the white bikes that are attached to road posts where there's been a fatal accident and other touch physical memorials for people who've lost their lives through crime. But in the case of eponymous law, these acts of memorialization and commemoration are part of the legal order with significance for the state and for subjects of the law. This means that this is a specific kind of commemoration and memorialization. Eponymous law fosters and relies on connections between the past and the future, political action, social memory, political action and social memory, the individual and the collective, the family and the state, the private and the public. So it's, I think, an important and interesting topic. This lecture has three parts. First, I'm going to put some context around the practice of eponymous law, setting the scene for its emergence in our jurisdiction and around the world in the last decades. Then I'm going to turn to ref look at the publicly reported statements that victims' families have for agitating for eponymous law. So looking at press coverage of victims' families arguing for new or different law. And finally, I'm going to step back and reflect on the significance of eponymous law for the criminal law. At the outset, I'm going to note that I'm focusing on only a subset of a large category of eponymous law, those laws that are named after victims of homicide. So I'm speaking about victims rather than victim survivors, um, and I'm speaking about a, a set of laws that are I'm looking at qualitatively, if you like, rather than in any kind of quantitative way. This is a large field, and there's only um, some laws that I'm going to be mentioning tonight that fall into this category of eponymous laws. That's the plan. All right. Let's check the time. All right. Great. So part one, the context in which, within which eponymous law arises. With reference to the Australian context, the practice of naming laws after victims of crime arose against a backdrop set by three features. The rise of the victims movement since the 1970s, an expansion of the criminal law over those same decades, and an increase in political popularity of victim-oriented law reform, which is probably a more recent um, development. So I'm going to say a few words about each of these in turn. And I should note that these are topics in themselves. So it's only a brief overview, but I hope it will set the scene. The rise of the victims movement in Australia and around the world in the period since the 1970s is probably the most important contextual precursor, if you like, to the development of eponymous law. The victims movement is a social movement a multifaceted phenomenon that's connected to other social movements of this time, such as the women's movement. It revolves around the changed social meanings of victimhood and victim identity and the changed symbolic power of victims. This was a seismic change. In the current era, it's hard to think of a time when victims were not important in criminal justice debates or in the context of reporting on crime, but in fact, actually, that was the case up until this period. In the current era, victims occupy a really prominent position which extends beyond their case and connects to wide or evokes wider and deeper issues such as fear of crime, public safety, the operation of the system of criminal justice, even the nature of society itself. Recent in illustrations of the importance of the victims' movement and the power of victims in social and political and legal life come from Black Lives Matter and Me Too movements. 
the rise of the victims movement profoundly impacted criminal justice. The, victim, the role of the victim has been radically reconstructed from someone who was marginal to the adversarial process to someone who's something like a participant with interests to advance and interests to protect. And the impact of this change status of victims can also be detected in law reform. So for instance, in recent changes to mental incapacity law in my jurisdiction, to the inclusion of victim impact statements as part of sentencing processes around Australia, and in changes to sexual, um, to criminal procedures such as the removal of gag laws that prevent victims of sexual assault speaking, and that's been connected to the Let Her Speak campaign. As this suggests, although victims may have no formal role in criminal trials, they've been recognised to have an inherent, and I quote, inherent interest in criminal justice responses to crime. As the Victorian Law Reform Commission said in 2016, the time has come for the proper interests of victims as a participant, whether a witness or not, in the criminal trial process to be recognised. This is part of the evolution of the criminal law. The change status of victim survivors and victims in victims' families in criminal justice opened the way for eponymous law. Crucially, the victims' movement changed the epistemological and ontological status of victims and victim identity. Victim survivors are now recognised as bringing a crucial and distinctive authority to debates about criminal law and its reform. This authority arises from their position outside institutions of justice and government at the living edge of victimisation through crime and from their knowledge, which is experiential knowledge or the knowledge that comes from experience. It is victims who are thought to have the truth about crime. And thus, in seeking to understand the reality of criminal offending in institutions of the state, we now turn to victims and royal commissions and other inquiries spend much time hearing from victims and speaking to victims alongside experts. Victims' experiential knowledge is contrasted with the, criminal, with the knowledge of criminal insiders, law professionals and experts who have intellectual and dispassionate knowledge as opposed to emotional, felt, genuine knowledge. Eponymous law rests on this changed status of victims. And an illustration is provided by one of the first eponymous laws in Australia, which was called Carly's Law, enacted at a Commonwealth level and a state level in South Australia. Carly Ryan was 15 years old when in 2007 she was murdered by an adult man that she'd met on the internet. He was posing as a teenage boy on the social media platform MySpace, and he lured her to meet him in person. Carly was the first person in Australia killed by someone she met on the internet. And this offence occurred at the time of the emergence of what we now call catfishing. Carly's mother, Sonia Ryan, campaigned for Carly's law, which criminalises an adult using an, the internet, a carriage, as we'd say in the old-fashioned language, to commit an act of preparation or planning to cause harm to, or to procure sexual activity with a minor. On the first use of Carly's law, the police commented, I must acknowledge Carly's mother, Sonia Ryan, who has endured the ultimate pain of losing a child at the hands of an online predator. Sonia campaigned tirelessly for the law that would give police more power to intervene before a predator had a chance to act. And yesterday we, we used this new law to potentially save a life. Here, Sonia's experience is distinguished and held up above the experience of the professionals, in this case the police. Carly's mother, has, Carly's mother, Sonia, has distinct authorial status, and this is used to reinforce the urgency of the reform that's being uh, discussed and its perceived value in developing effective criminal laws. This instance of eponymous laws also, law also points to the overlap between victims' interests and those of institutions such as the police. The second contextual factor for the rise of eponymous law is the expansion of the criminal law. Across common law countries like Australia, there has been a significant expansion in criminal law in the decades since the 1970s. This expansion has been fueled by new and growing demands on the administrative state and the growth of actuarial knowledges around risk and prediction. 
Quantitative measures of this increase vary depending on what's counted. New offences, new pieces of legislation, which may or may not appear to be criminal on their face, and whether secondary, secondary legislation such as ordinances is included. But it's generally accepted that this is a big increase. And the increase is one of scope, because criminal law has been asked to do more things, to encompass pre-crime, to deal with civil criminal hybrids, and administrative offences such as those that were in place under COVID. While the growth of the criminal law has been labelled over-criminalisation by criminal law theorists, which is broadly too much criminal law, the reality is more complex because in some of these areas, in particular in intimate partner violence, criminal law was playing catch up with an, an, in an area that had been subject to historical neglect. And as well as suggesting that there's a problem of undercriminalization in some places, this expansion in, raises questions about the place of criminal law in the broader regulatory mix, how much criminal law is appropriate. Leaving aside normative concerns about overcriminalization that have occupied many scholars, I think that there's an important aspect of the growth of criminal law that we tend to overlook, and that is that it has fed into a perception about an enormous criminal justice bureaucracy, peopled by professionals with institutionally derived obligations and loyalties who are bolstered by this raft of criminal laws largely inaccessible to the ordinary person. As sociologists of work and organisations tell us, professionals like lawyers claim exclusivity, self-governance, high social status and expert knowledge. But the current era, late modernity, is marked by definition with contestation around expertise. What is the value of professional judgment? How to use discretion? These defining features of late modernity give rise to suspicion around professional judgments and a distrust of authority. And I think that that suspicion and distrust can be, is reinforced by restrictions on individual autonomy, such as in sentencing or in the use of technology and automation in, fear, in spheres such as fines, which take the human out of the interaction with criminal justice, of criminal justice in, um, interaction with members of the public. Against this background, eponymous laws connect elite systems and knowledges to ordinary, quote unquote, people and represent a personalization of the law, a real person rather than a bureaucracy. Returning to the demands to enact Pockham's law, Pockham's mother, Auntie Donna Nelson stated, I want these reforms to be made in honor of my daughter. So lawmakers can be reminded of how cruel and inhumane prison can be to our mob. You were supposed to change bail laws to stop a white male monster from killing people, but instead you filled our prisons with non-violent Aboriginal women like my daughter. It's time to save our daughters. It's time to save, change the law. As these powerful words indicate, making a real person the face of the law has the power to expose problems that exist with the system, in this case bail, that experts cannot or will not see. The third factor that gives the context for the rise of eponymous law is in a way a consequence of the first two, and that's the increase in, this is the increase in the political popularity of victim-oriented reform. This is the type of law reform that aims, or at least claims to aim, to improve the experience of victims in the criminal justice system. At a general level, this type of victim-oriented law reform reflects both an assumption and an expectation about law, that it should serve or better serve victims, and indeed that it has better served offenders in the, and that parliamentarians and other legal actors such as judges should be responsive to victim concerns. And with increases in fear of crime, penal populism, law and order politics, there are strong political imperatives to embrace victim oriented criminal law reform, including eponymous law. Eponymous law is attractive in this context in particular because it connects politicians with victims of crime, linking the private and the public, the individual and the collective, and the past and the future. An illustration of this is provided by Brodie's Law, which people in this jurisdiction may know. 
introduced in 2011 following the suicide of Brodie Panlock, who was just 19 when in 2006 she died following relentless bullying in a cafe where she worked. At the time, the offenders were charged with her, who were her co-workers, were charged under the Occupational Health and Safety Act. They were fined. They weren't charged with a criminal offence. As a result of lobbying by Brodie's parents and with high levels of media attention, State Parliament enacted Brodie's Law, which amended the Crimes Act in Victoria to make serious bullying a dimension of the provisions that were already there relating to stalking. Reflecting on the passage of Brodie's Law through the Victorian Parliament with unanimous support, Brodie's father, Roy Panlock, has stated, I think on the day it was fantastic. We saw all the different parliamentarians. They were all talking exactly the same. There was no arguments. There was no yelling. It was all just quiet. One person spoke, one after another. It got a bit deep, so we did leave for a while because it was just a bit too much. They came and shook our hands and hugged us and all this sort of stuff, so it was pretty overwhelming. As these words indicate, this type of legal change appears to be non-partisan and connects with parliamentarians on a personal level, apparently separate from the cut and thrust of politics around crime. Connecting with victims also enables parliamentarians to link themselves to ordinary people and reinforces the idea that legal change is meaningful and relevant. And political engagement with victim demands for new or different law might be a good option for politicians. For instance, a new statute might be politically effect a politically effective solution to a particular crisis at hand. An example here is the, the recent enactment of what's called Hannah's Law in Queensland. The February 2020 deaths of Hannah Clark and her three children in a car which was lit on fire by her estranged partner galvanised public and political attention around coercive control, which we now, a term we now know both inside criminal law conversations and outside. Hannah Clark's parents, Sue and Lloyd Clark, have been strong advocates of the criminalisation of coercive control. There was a, public, a parliamentary inquiry into the creation of the new, a new offence, and it was enacted earlier this year. As part of a suite of reforms known as Hannah's Law, this is a kind of package, if you like, trying to deal with um, intimate partner violence. Hannah's parents were quoted in the press release from the Premier of Queensland when she announced the changes in 2022. They were quoted as welcoming the government's response. This close connection between political action and victim advocacy shows the ways in which victims' families are incorporated into political processes. These three factors together help set the scene for the emergence of epon eponymous law in these recent decades. And I turn now to talk to you about the kinds of motives that the victims' families have made public in their advocacy for law or law reform. So here I'm speaking about what seems to be the kind of way of making meaning for families when they come to talk about when they explain why they're agitating for criminal law reform in the name of their loved one who died through crime. There are four categories here that attempt to, attempt to organise the multiple meanings that victims' families have for engaging, agitating for eponymous law. The first one is making meaning out of traumatic loss. From the publicly reported statements of victims' families, it seems as if making, agitating for law reform, making a change, can be part of a meaning-making process throwing, following a traumatic loss or bereavement. After his son, Stephen Tuffer, was killed while on duty as an ambulance officer earlier this year, Jeff Tuffer began agitating for sentencing reform in New South Wales. He established a petition on change.org calling for mandatory life imprisonment for offenders who kill frontline walk workers, and he asked for this to be named Stephen's Law. He stated, if you're appalled by what has happened to my son, then use that energy to support me on a quest for a safer workplace for all service workers. The very fabric of society needs to know that they are protected by these laws. And lastly, please advocate for them to be named Stephen's Law. We cannot let the anguish that we feel be wasted as frivolously as was my son. 
Victims' families also want to honour the victim. Again in Victoria, in 2022, Lynn's Law was advocated for following the very high profile crash on the Eastern Freeway in which four police officers, including leading senior constable Lynette Taylor, were killed. As is well known, the police officers had pulled over a speeding car and the driver of that car filmed and mocked Constable Taylor as she was dying, causing widespread outrage. Constable Taylor's husband, Stuart Schultz, campaigned for a new law in the name of his deceased wife. He initiated a petition calling for change. He met with the Attorney General and he spoke to the media. The new law, Lynn's Law, abolished an old common law offence and created the new offence of engaging in contact that is grossly offensive to community standards of behaviour. Stuart Schultz said he had the support of the families of other officers killed on that day. And when asked about the legacy he was creating for his wife, he said, she was a pretty private person. She didn't like the limelight, but I think she'd be pleased that I'd done something for her. When Brodie Donegan was injured following a car, a car drive, driven by a drug-affected driver hitting her while she was walking on the side of the road, she lost her unborn baby, Zoe, at 32 weeks. Shocked that Zoe's death would be treated as an injury to her, because the law at the time regarded it as grievous bodily harm to a, the mother, Brodie spearheaded a campaign to reform laws of assault in New South Wales. As Brodie said, it's hard to come to grips with to be told that someone you, who caused the death of your baby is not being charged with the death of your baby. The following year in 2010, so that was in 2009, Zoe's death prompted the New South Wales government to conduct a review of the laws, and then subsequently bills were drafted in order to change the situation for, in a, for an assault in this context. And there were several bills, but the one that was successful enacted two changes in New South Wales criminal law, one creating an additional penalty and one creating a new offence, which is where a foetus has died as a result of criminal offending. Reflecting on these developments in a recent article, Brodie Donegan stated, all I wanted was to have an acknowledgement that we had lost Zoe and that this was not just a crime against me. Victims' families also want to prevent this from happening to other families, so prevent it happening to anyone else. They seem to be motivated by concern for others and their public comments reveal a strong desire to help ensure that this doesn't happen to others. Recalling the case of Pockham and Pockham's Law, which I've mentioned, the partner of the deceased Pockham, Uncle Percy Lovett stated, everyone should be presumed innocent. They should have a right to bail. And I want to make sure no one else goes through what Pockham went through. Returning to Carly's Law, also mentioned above, Sonia Ryan, Carly's mother said, the significance of my daughter's murder went beyond what I felt. Carly was the first victim of a violent crime perpetrated through the internet. It's now my duty to do whatever is necessary to prevent the suffering of other innocent children. And again, in relation to Brodie's law, Brodie's parents, Damien and Ray Panlock, have explained, nothing will bring Brodie back, but it's nice to know that something is something positive, that there is something positive that they will remember Brodie for, and hopefully she will make that a lot easier for people. Of course, victims' families are not naive. The creation of nobody, no parole laws, as they're called, named after Lynette Lawson, who was um, killed by her husband 30 years prior to his conviction, co prompted a big outswell of um, um, significant concern that there was no such law in New South Wales. But when asked if the new law would help her father reveal the location of her mother's body, so no body, no parole, no parole if the defendant doesn't, if Ender doesn't help the police in revealing the location of the remains of the person, Lynette's daughter said, whose name is Chanel, I don't think he's going to do it. I just think he believes his own lies and he won't admit it. So there's an optimism and a hope here, but not a naivety, I think. The last factor that comes through in the victim's family statements about their reasons or motives for engaging in eponymous law is about creating a legacy. 
Families' public statements suggest that they're motivated to create a positive legacy from the loss of their loved one. And here there's another um, instance of an eponymous law from recent years in New South Wales. When four young cousins who were walking to get an ice cream in suburban Sydney were hit by a driver who was both drunk and on drugs, there was no particular offence that prescribed both alcohol and drugs. And the parents of the three, four young cousins campaigned for legal change under the name Four Angels Law. Subsequently, in 2021, our legislation in New South Wales was amended to create a separate offence of drink and drug driving. The new offence provides harsher penalties for a person who's convicted of both drunk driving with a prescribed concentration of alcohol and a prescribed drug in the, his system, his or her system, their system. Leila Abdallah, who's one of the mothers, who's a mother of the three of the children, said, our four beautiful angels were taken from us in the most terrible way. We now live with constant pain and wake up to this every day. This law is their legacy to put a stop to more tragedies, pain and suffering. And returning to Brodie's law, Brodie's mother has said, it's like a legacy in a way, but it's never the way you want your child to have a legacy. These laws create a complex, achieve a complex alchemy. Naming laws after victims makes a specific victim and a specific homicide stand out from other homicides with other victims. In this sense, the crime is spectacular and the victims are not like other victims. And of course, only some families have the emotional, financial and other resources to agitate for law reform in the wake of a traumatic loss. And only some victims are the kind of victims who galvanise media and public attention. And we know from feminist, criminological and other research that there is such a thing as an ideal victim, a victim who's most readily able to be sympathised with and understood in wider media and other culture. But these laws also make a victim stand in for other victims, right? Stand to represent other victims making this particular victim the symbol, if you like, of other victims of the same crime. So the one victim becomes representative of victims of that crime more broadly. This kind of complex alchemy, I think, really shows some of the power and distinctiveness of eponymous law, things that we, I think, are yet to take seriously in the context of criminal law scholarship and thinking. It's now time to step back from the immediacy of these um, uh, considerations of the rise of eponymous law and the meanings that victims' families are giving for engaging in and agitating for such laws to think about the significance of the laws for the criminal law. And here I'm thinking about the challenges that these laws offer to criminal law. And I think there are at least three. The first one is about taking new social actors seriously. As a particular kind of practice, eponymous law produces a particular kind of social actor. As victims and victims' families become experts in criminal law, criminal justice and policy, these, these individuals become professional victims, and I don't use that term pejoratively. They are asked to be experts and asked to advise government and to offer media commentary. So for instance, in discussing the possibility of a National Sex Offenders Register, Daniel Morecambe's father, Bruce, was presented as a view, had him, have, he had a view in favour, and he was set up as having a contrasting view with Dr. Karen Gelb from this university. So there was a kind of two sets of expertise that were presented as, equi as equivalent. Similarly, Neetha Reddy, Reddy, who's the sister of a victim, Preetha Reddy, who was killed by her estranged partner when she agreed to meet him because he was struggling to come to terms with their breakup. Her sister, Neetha, became an, uh, the person to be consulted about the creation of coercive control offences in a coercive control offence in New South Wales. She was an advocate for new law, and then when the laws were criticised, she was actually con reflecting on her own advocacy and said, I just want a best, the best legislation that will save lives. So in other words, becoming somebody who was both being asked for their opinion and being asked to reflect on their opinion, if you like, be asked to, ref to, to revise their views. 
Eponymous law is just one plank of a wider, of wider expert work done by victims' families. This is typically part of wider campaigning and advocacy with which victims' families become involved. So a number of the families um, who, are, who I mentioned in this lecture tonight create foundations to carry on their work. They become fundraisers. They become members who are active in a range of work for education and other activities. So the Daniel Morecambe Foundation aims to educate children and young people about how to stay safe in physical and online environments and has developed a whole set of, emotion, of, of education resources for use in schools. The Carly Ryan Foundation provides a series of fact sheets about apps that children might be using. So you can download a fact sheet so you know how to, what, how to log in and what kind of concerns you might have about that particular app, what to watch out for. The parents of Hannah Clark, who I mentioned, have established a foundation which is called Small Steps for Hannah, and it aims to raise awareness about domestic violence, educate children and young people, and it's become a partner in a range of initiatives, including providing um, safe housing, which has wraparound care associated with it, so availability of experts to help women who've fled domestic violence and intimate partner violence contexts. These social actors are already altering the landscape on which criminal law reform is discussed, developed, and enacted. And the challenge for us as insiders is to find ways of working across with these individuals and others, not at odds, but in a way that traverses an increasingly blurry boundary around expertise. Another challenge of eponymous laws for criminal laws relates to the categories of thinking that we as scholars tend to use. And I think it asks for us to go beyond the simple binary between punitivism and progressivism. Eponymous laws suggest to me that we, in need, we are in need of new categories of thinking about law reform. The categories we traditionally use, like overcriminalization, are insufficiently nuanced. And even more fine-grained categorizations, such as those that are in use in the larger project of which this lecture is a part, might fail to capture what's really at issue in law reform. For example, recognition in the case of Zoe's law or disgust in the case of Lynn's, laws, Lynn's law. Now, of course, we need to reflect on the appropriateness of accommodating these kinds of sentiments in the criminal law. But public concerns about accurate labelling, modernised or fit-for-purpose laws, seem to me to warrant consideration. So then, does eponymous law represent popular punitivism? I'm not sure. Returning to the Four Angels Law that we mentioned earlier, criminalising drink and drug driving, it's notable that at the same time as campaigning for change in the law to make a particular offence of drug and drink driving, Daniel and Layla Abdal are the parents of three of the children, established a foundation called I Forgive. Quote, to increase community awareness about the power of forgiveness, to transform human relationships and to provide resilience towards human flourishing. This foundation, which arises out of and reflects the family's Maronite Christian faith, supports a National Day of Forgiveness on the 1st of February, which is the day the children died. This specific example suggests that punitivism is not really the most accurate characterisation of the law. Something much more nuanced is going on. I think that eponymous law is capturing the affective dimension of law reform, something that we tend to ignore as criminal law scholars. Eponymous law represents a personal engagement with the state, and it makes emotion overt, which is typically buried in criminal law reform. Victims' families have a range of motivations, but I think they're calling for more emotional literacy on the part of scholars and reformers, and I'm asking myself if we're up to this challenge. The third and final challenge presented by eponymous laws relates to legitimation of criminal law under changed conditions. Eponymous law challenges the legitimation of criminal law, where its social ratification as a system of censure and sanction typically relied on a moral consensus and robust political and other processes. But under conditions of moral pluralism in the current era, and when we have um, challenges in the political processes highlighted by instances of corruption and other matters, 
we found that criminal law scholars have retreated to a narrow core of criminal offending, the real criminal law, quote unquote ignoring the vast bulk of criminal law as merely administrative or political in a pejorative sense. But I think it's not easy to dismiss eponymous law. A number of the claims made for new law proceed on the basis of a perceived gap, not just an error, but an absence within the fabric of the criminal law. And I'm thinking here of the Four Angels Law or Hannah's Law. This perception of a gap goes beyond a call for more or harsher penalties. It's something much more fundamental, that people have been left out or omitted from the coverage of the law. But in assuming a gap, eponymous law creates a gap, and the perception of other as yet unknown gaps hang over the, hangs over the criminal law. Eponymous law is grounded in a faith and a hope that legal change brings real world change. As Stuart Schultz, who campaigned for Lynn's Law, stated, I believe in the law and I understand the interpretation of the law will be made correctly. Under this legislation, with guidance of the Act, correct decisions will be made. Does the law warrant this kind of hope and this kind of faith? One reason to say that it doesn't would be to say, well, the causes of crime are structural. They lie in wicked problems like gender oppression, toxic masculinity, disadvantage, discrimination, substance abuse, untreated mental health issues, and the list goes on. But another response would be equally as bleak, which is that the criminal law is only ever coming in too late after life has been lost or harmed. And I think this is the sober note on which I'd like to end the lecture. I've offered a topic of study that I think we are not taking seriously. I've asked us to think critically about this practice as a social practice with meaning that goes beyond the criminal law. I've talked about the victim's family's motivations, mm -hmm. trying to reflect on that for my own practice and then re re turn to look at what challenges this particular development in criminal law might have for us. This lecture was hard to write. It was hard to research, it was hard to think about, it was hard to write. And that's because it involved repeatedly going back to think about victims' experiences and to wonder how the criminal law could ever be living up to the requests for change that they ask for. Thank you. Thanks so much for that, Ali. That was wonderful. Um, before we all uh, adjourn outside for, for drinks, we have 10 minutes or so for questions. So Ali and I will take a seat. And you, want, you actually need to sit over here, I think. Is that right? Which one? It's the other way around. OK, right, <laughs> sit there. I know we were given directions on we this. Were. I think we um, got it right. So yeah, so if there are any questions, please um, go ahead. And also, can you please use the microphones, because we are recording, so. Hi, um, thank you so much for a wonderful lecture. I was wondering whether you believe there's a difference in how eponymous laws are treated. Uh, on one hand, like the Four Angels Law, which increases criminalisation or creates new criminal offences, uh, compared to something like Pockham's Law, which points to the failures of the criminal justice system, or laws in favour of um, uh, harsher penalties on police, for instance, in terms of deaths in custody? Whether you think there's a difference in how both of those are treated? Mm. Thank you very much. It's a good question. I don't think I need a microphone. I can just respond. Um, I, I think going into the research that's presented here tonight, I assumed there would be. But I think actually, if you look at eponymous law as a practice, you have to unite those different kinds of claims. And in a way, the distinctions that you and I would look at and think about are not necessarily as important to people coming in from outside the system as they might be to us inside the system. And I think it's tempting to think about the kind of changes that we like as progressive and interesting and important. But in actual fact, of course, community engagement with law, legitimation, legitimacy are important as well. And so we've got a challenge, I suppose, to think about how it is that we move beyond mere, reven mere revenge. I don't see any evidence of that in my research, but also how we think about constructive reform that perhaps brings many people to the table. And it's a, it's a big challenge. Jeremy, in the middle.
That was so interesting. Um, I'm, I couldn't stop thinking about Pockham's Law, um, the example you gave. And one question that came up in my mind is Pockham's Law is in part a, re a repeal of an earlier law from 2018, which, as you mentioned, and as Pockham's relative mentioned, was passed to in response to another homicide, mm. the Burke Street killings. Uh, that one didn't get a named a name for whatever reason, and there, there could be a number of reasons there, but one thing it made me wonder is what if it had got a name? What if it was called, I think I just looked it up now, one of the children killed in that crime was named Talia. If it was called Talia's Law, would it have been harder to reverse it? Uh, that's, really, that's really the question. What, do these laws ever get repealed? And, and how is that dealt with? Thank you, Jeremy. Typically tricky question from you. I think, I think that we, I think the relative recency of the practice means it would be hard to point to those repeals of a particular law. And I did not find any in my research, but it's something to look out for because I agree, I think the, or perhaps I agree with what you might be hinting at, I think there's something there that makes, would make it difficult to repeal. And that's because it, it's, th it's that kind of memorialization and commemoration that comes inside the law as opposed to stays outside. And I think that that does make it challenging. It's very interesting because there's a lot of victim-oriented reform, right? There's a lot of reform that doesn't have a name of a person who was killed or is a victim survivor. And so it's not that a name has to go with a reform that adheres to or represents or complies with victim requests for more responsive or different law. But I think and that's why that's, this is so distinctive, because this does do something different from those kinds of laws. This is something... This is something that I think we have to understand as a, as a, if you like, a practice, something that's distinctive, because it's not the same as other kinds of reform, even when the imperatives are the same, like, for example, recognition of the victim experience. Mm. Mm. There was a question over there. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> thank you so much. That was really interesting and, and lots of food for thought in that. Um, I wondered what... What would your response be to a critique that says something like, look, a lot of these proposals for new laws that, that purport to identify a gap in, in the legislation, the, the real gap or the real problem is, in, is not in the law, it's in police practices or, or problems in the, the justice system generally, you know, the prisons or the courts. Um, but that from a politician's point of view, it's much easier and it's more popular to just pass a new law than actually address these more deep-seated um, cultural, if you like, problems. Um, and that by campaigning for these sort of laws, perhaps we're drawing attention away from um, the real problem. H how do you respond to that? Thank you. Yes, I think I, think I would, I think I, I would have said I agree with that critique prior to doing the research. But then in doing the research, I suppose I thought, so the ready critique is these are things that can be done by politicians because they are achieved at the stroke of a pen, right? They're something that doesn't require more resources, doesn't require different kinds of practices, better training or anything that's going to cost money. And it doesn't go to something like the heart of a criminal justice system where we might, we might all becoming abolitionists, right? But I think that, in a way, then, that, that critique answers itself because there's no such thing as a, an, um, a stroke of a pen that costs another stroke of a pen, right? So, in other words, if you define something as, as being meaningful in those terms, then you don't, have a, you don't do one thing and don't do another, right? So, in that sense, and can't do another. So, in that sense, I think these things might become possible because they are politically achievable, and they obviously are attracted, attractive for politicians in that sense. But there doesn't, it doesn't mean that there can't be the kind of systemic reform that we all know is needed in bail, in, in prisons, in, 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 in respect to criminal justice more generally. I suppose the other dimension is that I think I was struck in doing this research by the kind of skew of the eponymous laws in one direction, which is towards offences, new, new offences. And in that sense, I think that's, that is very much a representation of the kind of quick fix that a politician might see as attractive. Something like deaths in custody is not attracting the same kinds of 
named laws as other areas like a new offence in a particular context. That's complex. That's partly because of who's dying in custody, right? And whether those people can be named and whether those families have the resources to agitate for this kind of reform. It's really interesting that Pockham's Law, the name of a person supported by her, advocated for by her family, is backed by a raft of institutions. They've come behind that reform. So rather than come together, and there's, there's, there's a very large number of these institutions, they've all come on board, but they've come in behind. So in a way, there's a kind of awareness there that, the, that the, what will work is the person, the face of the person and her name in the front and the institutional kind of pressures points, if you like, the people who've been saying this change is needed for a long time since it was enacted earlier, are behind the scenes with, I think, political nous, right? Because there's a kind of, there's a, there's a narrow entry point and it's this, the size of this person, I think. Thank you so much for your presentation. I have two questions which may be off topic, but I'm curious to hear your opinion. So the first is, when do you believe um, from a federal level the uh, sexual uh, perpetrator registry will like come into place? Yeah, uh, yes, so, so it was, it was in 2019, it was budgeted for and there was a consultation period but the Morris, it was the Morrison government and it, it fell by the wayside. So I'm not sure. There, there's very strong views against and there's lots of empirical evidence that suggests those laws are not effective, but they've been enacted in Western Australia and they were mooted and considered in Northern Territory and then a political a, a change of government kind of made them fall to the side. I don't think, that, I don't think they've gone away, but I, I don't know if there's any particular time frame on when they might be enacted. And then the second one is with domestic violence and really the focus on prevention before it happens, where do you think as a government or just in Australia in general, we're falling short and why aren't we getting the coverage about this as the reporting is skewed as itself? Like, so what's your thoughts about that? Good, good point. I think, and there's much amazing work being done in this room, so I'm very conscious that others might want to respond. I, I think actually the kinds of changes we're getting at now are moving towards education and cultural change, and I think that's where things have to go. I think that the kinds of initiatives that are coming in, as you said before, are actually so far before that we tend to think of them as happening in another kind of sphere, right? Education and... And, and what have you, but that's to me where the hope is, yeah. I was almost thinking to myself at the end of this lecture because I was referring back to a claim for education, which is what Hannah Clark's parents have asked for through for, for step, small steps for Hannah, thinking I, I did really want to become a teacher. <laughs> but in actual fact, I'm, it was a little bit, I'm not that depressed about the law, but I do feel like the really important change can happen outside. And I feel that more and more. Can, can I just ask what happens when the law they're campaigning for is not what they wanted? So I know Bodie's law, for example, started to be utilised, her, her calls for uh, some kind of offence in relation to the loss of a child was used by the anti-abortion kind of. And Pokem's law also perhaps hasn't gone as far as Pokem might have wanted it to or Pokem's family. So what, what's the story there? Yes, thanks, Heather. That's a really good point. And I think, so, so, so Hannah, um, Heather was referring back to Zoe's law, Zoe's which, law yep. which was a, um, the campaign by Brodie Donegan to have the death of her 32-week-old 32 baby recognised as a separate offence to the harm to her. And she got really caught up in a, a whole political process that actually, she later said, didn't give her any comfort. So people who know this development, Fred Nile, the MLC in, in um, New South Wales, the legislature the, took the issue, if you like, almost took it from her and campaigned and drafted legislation that didn't pass. And 
Brodie Donegan was later interviewed saying, actually, I never wanted to create a law that would impinge women's right to choose, mm. but this kind of went out of her hands. Mm. And it was, it was a very interesting development because in actual fact, she was being used as a public face of something that she didn't support. I think that gets very complex. A risk. Yeah. yeah, exactly, a real risk. And even though we could say victims get involved in criminal law processes, one could also say victims get co-opted by criminal justice processes. Mm. One more question, perhaps, and just at the front from Amy. And to that end, um, how can we better protect victims and victim survivors and their families when they're campaigning for these you know, incredibly personal and important laws to be um, passed? How can we best, I guess, protect the fidelity of, or the heart of the law that they're wanting to pass? So better protect victims and families in advocating for change, yeah. Um, I'm amazed at the resources, that the personal resources that people have put together and I've read enough now to see that people say, this is what helped me go on. This is what made it possible to keep going. And so I can see there's that kind of psychological imperative for people in this kind of context. But I suppose what's interesting is this it reflects back to this kind of question about how people get co-opted. I think that people, that victims' families are becoming quite savvy. And some you can see have media advisors and have people who are acting as intermediaries between them and the kind of political process, maybe also experts of a traditional kind like lawyers coming in to assist. It does seem to me as there'd be a really careful balance to be struck there between hampering the individuality and creativity of those kinds of approaches and protecting the people who want to make those changes. And I'm not sure there'd be any easy answer because obviously these individuals as new social actors, as I put it, are between the public and the private, they're non-government organisations, they're um, not, they're in an interface, if you like, between the experience they had and the change they want. And so helping might in fact be constraining, or I think it's, it might be quite challenging. That might be a good point for us to end on, but before we do, I just want to say, um, thank you so much, Ali, for joining us. It's been thank an absolute you very pleasure much. to hear you speak. It's Fantastic. Great. Thank you very um, much. Thank I'm you. sure Peter Brett would be really happy to have heard this lecture. Thank you very much. Um, so thank you all for coming along as well on such a cold night after a big late night with the Matildas, sadly. Yeah. Um, and, but we hope you all join us outside for further drinks and a few bits of food tweets and refreshments. And I'm sure Ali will be able to answer more questions outside as well.